On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, the Model Y has been revealed. I was very lucky I got to be at the event and attend the thing in person and check it out. Stay tuned for all the details and analysis of the announcement. Why ask why? Let's just ride. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey. To my left, Daisy the Boxer Puppy, who is currently gnawing on the bone marrow of, well, I don't know what animal that came from, but that bone's been well worth the money. It's lasted quite a while. She is happy, and so am I. I, I was so lucky I got to attend the Model Y unveiling down at the Tesla Design Studio in Hawthorne, California, within Los Angeles there. Uh, my second time to that place after being in the same spot for the Model 3 reveal almost three years ago to the day. That was March 31st, 2016. This one was March 14th, of course, 2019. So I want to jump right in, get right to it. I've got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, we'll go over, of course, everything about the Model Y, my impressions of it. I did get a test ride. I'll tell you what I thought of it, both sort of being able to see it in person, but also get a quick ride in it. Uh, and then I certainly want to address, there was uh, another bit of huge Tesla news this week, the uh, walking back of some of the, the policy and pricing decisions that have been rolled out over the, la the previous couple of weeks. So I can't let this episode go by without addressing that, even though it's going to be a heck of a, a heck of a gear shift from from the excitement of the Model Y unveil to uh, to talk about that, but certainly need to cover that. So starting with the Model Y, let's go over the specifics real quick. If you haven't seen them, uh, they will look mighty familiar to you if you've poked around the Model 3 design studio at any point in recent time. The standard range Model Y starts at thirty nine thousand dollars with a 230 mile range battery with availability on that one specifically in early 2021, according to Tesla, whereas the rest of the lineup, the, the higher price trims are showing uh, production expected to begin in fall of 2020. So as for the standard range, that base Model Y, there is no way, there's no way it's the same standard pack as the Model 3 has, which gets... 220. Uh, last week, I, I believe, I could swear I had it in my notes. Maybe I had it in my head and never said it, but I, I had guessed that the Y's standard range pack might be the 3's standard plus, but with that 230 mile range, I actually think the standard pack in the, in the Y might be the Model 3's mid-range pack. You know, that's a 264 mile pack in the 3. You take off a 10% hit, and yeah, you're not far off from uh, from 230. In fact, it would be sort of on the conservative side, taking about 10% off. But that's that's kind of what I'm figuring. We know they use the same battery packs, uh, the two, the, the three and the Y, as far as the the shape and the form factor of them, and the same long range pack, the same uh, dual motors, the you know, same motors, all that stuff. So we'll see, we'll see what that. But the the bottom line is 230 miles base range on the Y for $39,000. Uh, now, the other key thing, well, one of the other key things, I'll talk more as I go here, but the third row seating, yes, it does have optional third row seating for two, similar to the Model X, and that is a $3,000 option. However, even if you order one of the trims that are going to be starting production in fall of 2020, meaning the long range dual motor or performance, the uh, you will not get your car if you're ordering a third row until a very generic 2021. That's all. They won't say early, mid, late. 2021 is all Tesla is saying for third row availability on the Model Y. But as for the rest of it, as I said, it will be very, very familiar to anybody who has uh, bought or shopped for a Model 3. The same five paint colors, the uh, the same, mostly the same options. So you've got a rear wheel drive, long range, that's the uh, the range king on the Y, so that'll get you 300 EPA range miles. Of course, you're only going to get that with those 18-inch aero wheels. You'll take a bit of a hit if you get the 19-inch sports. 
And then on uh, dual motor, that car is rated for 280 miles of range on the on that base long range, and the performance is rated the same as well. However, again, speaking from very personal experience, the performance, you have no choice but to take the same 20-inch sport wheels that I have on my Performance Model 3, and I can tell you that you are going to take a larger range hit on those. So um, it's good that they're they're adjusting, you know, because my car is technically classified as a 310 mile range car. It's not. It it is not with those wheels. It's not going to get that. Not on. Uh, not unless I'm going downhill for a long ways. But um, yeah, I would expect uh, the the performance model Y real world with those 20 inch wheels is going to be. 250, maybe even a tad less, because my lifetime watt hours per mile in my car, with you know just mixed driving, city. I've done a couple road trips. I I get on it and have fun sometimes. You know, just kind of a mix of everything. My lifetime watt hours per mile is 300, uh, which comes out, which translates to about right about a 250 mile range. So anyway, if you're shopping for a performance Y, just bear that in mind. Um, now the other thing Tesla says that I I politely dispute other than, besides the range that I just talked about on the performance car is they they say that the third row will seat you know the, the car seats seven adults so I was in the car for the test ride I'll tell you a little bit more about this I I do not see um, many adults fitting in that third row the the top the the roof line uh, with that hatchback really slopes down uh, I was sitting in row two for my test ride but but that is that. So anyway, uh, getting back to it, $47,000 is going to be the base price for the aforementioned long-range rear-wheel drive Model Y. You'll kick up to $51,000 for the long-range dual motor, and the performance is going to start at $60,000. Bear in mind, there will be no federal incentives, tax incentives remaining by the time any Model Y delivers to anyone. Uh, state-wise, that's TBD. You know, California seems like they're probably going to keep the $2,500 thing going. Other states, you know, it's all case-by-case -case basis. Could the federal situation change? It could. I certainly wouldn't count on it. Just expect it not to. And then if it does, consider it a bonus. But um, so just factor that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about your, your future Model Y purchase as well. Everything else, pretty all all the other options are uh, are really the same price. Again, uh, other than from the base trims, you go into uh, you go into your paint color. All the paint colors are the same choice, same cost, fifteen hundred dollars for for uh, midnight silver metallic as well as the deep blue metallic black solid blacks free pearl white multi coat two grand and red multi coat at $2,500. And then autopilot, same thing. We got the $3,000 for the base price on, uh, on the car, as, uh, for, the, for the base package, I should say. And then the $5,000 for the full self-driving, which now that's got Navigate on Autopilot in it, as well as Auto Park Summon and soon to be en Enhanced Summon. And hopefully by the time that car ships, since we should see it later this year, the city driving stuff, the recognizing traffic lights and stop signs and doing, some, doing the city driving work. And then on the interior, again, same. You've got your choice of the all-black premium. Uh, on, again, on the, on, since the, the standard battery is not available yet, so uh, they're not even showing the option for that. But on the trims, on the long range and up, it's premium black, or premium white, and that premium white comes with a itself one thousand dollar premium. So that is the overview of the Model Y. There are no reservations; they are simply taking orders. Now, the one other thing to differentiate the Y from the three, from a configuration perspective, a default configuration perspective, is uh, the Chrome delete, the exposed chrome that you see on the Model Three. So that that trim around the windows. Uh, the trim on the you know the the auto the side autopilot camera housing on the front fenders, or actually I guess yeah right on the, the sort of the closest to the driver to the, to the doors the front doors, those are uh, those are just a, a a solid they're just a black a solid black now, 
uh, rather than a chrome. So that's that's just a little look, and the door handles as well. That's the certainly the other big one. So that's uh, that's an interesting little visual touch to differentiate the Y from the three a bit. So I'm gonna tell you all about what I thought of it and my thoughts on this car in general, as well as my test ride impressions and my impressions from really seeing it up close. But first, I do wanna walk through Elon Musk's presentation a bit. Not all of it, it was 35 minutes long, but I've got uh, a handful of clips here for you that I thought were interesting and, and worth talking about a little bit. So here is Elon. So he basically the, the presentation, if you didn't see it, was Elon walking through the history of Tesla and where they've come from uh, or how far they've come over the last 11 years. So he starts out by talking about they brought Roadster number one on stage, which belongs to Elon, uh, and they ended up putting it nose to nose with the next generation Roadster, the red uh, functioning prototype, which I happen to be standing right next to. I'll tell you more about that later, too. But um, yeah, so here's Elon talking about sort of the Roadster and then the Model S. Um, so, so the crazy thing is, uh, if, you, if you go back 11 years today, Tesla had made one car, that car. That's serial number one of, of, of Tesla. So that's, that's my car, actually. Um, so. Yeah. So it, it, and on, Fe on February 2008, uh, we, we'd literally only made one car, that car. Um, and it didn't really work very well, I have to say. It broke down a lot. Um, and it took us another three months just to make the second car. And now uh, we've made about 550,000 cars. And after the, the Roadster, uh, essentially what happened with the Roadster is we said, okay, we want to make a car, we want to really break the mold about how, you know, how do people think about electric cars. To think about electric cars as being slow and ugly and, and poor performance, so we want to have a sports car, you know, a car that is fast, looks good, uh, sexy, that's right. Ha ha, ha ha, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, sexier. Mm. <laughs> That's right. So, so, so the, the, the Roadster, we wanted to, the reason we did a sports car is we wanted to create a car that uh, would break the mold for electric vehicles. Um, and that, that would be, yeah, sexy and, and fast and long range. And um, that's, that's why we did the Roadster. Um, and uh, you know, people, people say that, well, you, you want to be able to make the, you won't be able to make a car with those specifications, and if you do, nobody will buy it. So we had to prove those two things wrong. And then after we made the Roadster, they said, okay, sure, you can make some toy sports car, but you can't make a, 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 a sedan. You can't, there's no way you could compete with the, uh, the, 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 the luxury sedans of, that are gasoline, because they're the best. Um, and you, there's no way you can make an electric car that's like that. So we did. <laughs> Model S. Exactly. So noisy. Where are all the fumes? Where's the exhaust pipe? Where do you put the gasoline? Yeah. So we actually started designing that car um, in the rocket factory. So we didn't have a, a design studio. Um, but we took a little corner of the rocket factory and, and, and Franz joined. And we just, uh, with a tiny crew in a corner, corner of the rocket factory, we, we designed that car. Um, and uh, I think this, that, that car was really important because it was competing against the best of the gasoline cars. So if you, compete against, if you can make an electric car that can, that can beat the best of the gasoline cars, that's just a, it's a very powerful statement um, to prove that, that you can go electric. So then, uh, working on the, from the Model S, uh, which, by the way, um, in terms of how, where the name comes from, actually, we, we, I like calling things what they are. So Roadster is called Roadster because it's a Roadster. There is, no, <laughs> there, there is no good word for sedan. 
<laughs> so we couldn't call it the sedan. It wouldn't work. Uh, or saloon. There's just like literally no word. So the, the, the Model S stands for sedan. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is how out of touch I was. I actually didn't realize at the time that Model S also means models. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then I had like a, at one point a license plate that said Model S2 because it was like the second production Model S and it was like, and, I, and as I was walking away from my car I said, wow, what a jerk, his license plate says Models 2? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like, okay. <laughs> Better not have that license plate. So on this topic, quick side note that occurred to me. I think the Model Y is the first Tesla vehicle whose name has absolutely no basis in reality. Because what I mean by that is, uh, you know, it's, it's named the Y because Y comes after X and they're both crossover SUVs. Model Y, Y doesn't stand for anything in this case, the way that you heard Elon talk about. S stands for sedan, X for crossover, roadster for roadster, semi for semi. Uh, so yeah, I just thought that was a, a funny little tidbit. Uh, speaking of the Model X, Elon spent uh, a minute on that. Here's a quick clip of Elon describing the Model X. So, um, but then going from the, from the Model S, we thought, okay, uh, we, we want to make uh, the, the, be the best SUV in the world. Um, we want to do something, we it kind of got carried away, actually, with the, with the Model X. Um, we, 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 we was like, let's, let's have we, we, practically every, every technology and whiz-bang thing we could possibly think of. Um, and uh, the Model X is like, as a car, it's like a Fabergé egg meets a spaceship. It's like, um, it was insanely difficult. So the reason I played that is because it's, it factors into the Model Y that would be about to be unveiled. If you've seen pictures of the Y already, you probably know where I'm going with this, but hang tight, let's continue. Here's Elon talking about uh, a, little, a little fun shot at Ford, and you'll, it'll, you'll laugh at why. But then after we had the Model S and the Model X, I thought it'd be pretty funny if, if we had the Model E. Um, uh, and, yeah, and, and, and then, but then like Ford threatened to sue us. Uh, <laughs> Ford killed sex. <laughs> but I said, what if we call it the Model 3? Because that's completely different for me. They said, that's fine. <laughs> So we have, we have the, the Model 3. Let's bring out Model 3. I figured that newer listeners may have never heard that story, so I thought I would include it real quick, because it is a fun story. All right, back to the proper history. Supercharging, the history of it and where it's going. Take a listen to this. And, and, and then uh, uh, supercharging. So, um, you know, the, the, the first, in 2010, we had zero superchargers. So there was no... You couldn't really dr drive long distances with an electric car uh, in, in 2010. Um, uh, so it was like, well, okay, we better have some high, some high power chargers, otherwise it's going to be extremely inconvenient to drive long distances. Um, so uh, built into the, the, the Model S um, was a high voltage DC bypass directly to the pack, so you could just sort of mainline power right, in, right into the pack. Um, and then we stick it. We, we, then, Nobody was building high, high power chargers, so like, okay, we better build these high power chargers because nobody's building them. And um, so we went from zero uh, superchargers to building a, a global network of superchargers. Yeah. Yeah, so. It's pretty nutty. Each one of those, each one of those is, is a supercharging site. So um, supercharging team has done an incredible job uh, building uh, a, a global network of superchargers that allow you to travel uh, to a massive section of, 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 the, of the world, basically anywhere in North America, almost anywhere in Europe, uh, most places in China, uh, not the Gobi Desert yet, but most places. Um, we'll, we'll cover the Gobi Desert. We'll get there. <laughs> and Saskatchewan, I, I swear to God, there it is. <laughs> I've specifically asked about the Saskatchewan supercharger, <laughs> and I'm told it is, it is under construction. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I've asked about it like twice. It's, I'm, t I'm told it's going to be completed soon, and then you'll actually be able to drive across Canada. Um, so, yes. 
Um, <laughs> Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Kazakhstan. <laughs> Actually, we, we have a, a, some great supporters in Kazakhstan. I think we probably... <laughs> we, we should have... We will build superchargers in Kazakhstan. There you. You heard it right here. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're going to build a lot more superchargers. Um, and, and we have actually a, a version 3 of the supercharger that we just unveiled. And in fact, uh, yeah. So the, the superchargers actually started out um, only at about 75 kilowatts, and now they're at, uh, with version 3, uh, 250 kilowatts, and we think probably can even go a little, little higher than that. Um, and so if you've got a long-range Model 3, it's, uh, it's capable of charging at about 1,000 miles an hour or 1,600 uh, kilometers an hour. Yeah. So, and, and we, uh, uh, we have one uh, working in the Bay Area, and then the one here at the Design Studio is uh, also working as of tonight. So, yeah. So, so we're going to be rolling out the version 3 supercharger uh, throughout the world, just gradually upgrading uh, the existing sites as well as adding new sites. Um, so we, we, did, we did slow down our, the supercharger rollout a little bit because we wanted them to be version 3 instead of version 2. Um, but now that we have version 3 running, and we'll, um, we're going to spool our production, and so you're going to have like, um, a radical improvement in supercharging uh, worldwide by sometime next year. The specific reason I played this clip is because I found part of that a little odd, uh, hopefully in a good way, in that I could swear that last week Tesla said that they weren't going to be upgrading existing supercharging sites to V3. He seemingly just said that they are. I really hope they are. Maybe he's referring to the 145 kilowatt bump that all this V2 supercharging sites are getting. I'm not sure, but... Uh, wanted to flag that in case, in case you, it happened to float on by you. Maybe, uh, maybe it's super clear and I missed it, but there's that. So good news on the supercharging front. Very happy to hear that, that things have actually been slow on purpose on the station rollout there and that they will now be speeding up as 2019 rolls on. Uh, you want to hear a really impressive fact that, that really puts a lot of context to the entire Tesla history and, and the electric car movement and how far Tesla has come. Take a listen to this. We've got, uh, obviously, the S3 and the X. Uh, we've uh, made, I think, 550,000 vehicles, something like that. Um, the the uh, 12 months from now, we will have made about a million vehicles. So, so it's, it's pretty wild to think that 11 years ago today, we had made literally one car, um, and a year from now, we will have made a million. Yeah. I mean, th this, is a, this is a testament to, to the incredible talent uh, and, and, and effort of the people at Tesla. I'll just say thank you to people at Tesla. You guys are incredible. I don't have anything to add to that, honestly. It's just I find that really incredible. I wanted to play it for you so that if you weren't watching the reveal or even if you were, that you just stop and think about that for a second because that, that really is pretty substantial. That's fantastic. All right, uh, a couple more clips from the reveal. Here's Elon talking about how the, the whole goal of Tesla is to get the rest of the industry going on electrification. And here are his comments on how far they have come in that department. You know, when we created it, we were like, okay, the fundamental historic good of Tesla should be measured by the degree to which we accelerate the advent of sustainable, uh, sustainable energy and transport. Um, and our goal all along has been to try to get the rest of the car industry to, uh, to go electric. We did a, a, a joint venture thing with, uh, with Toyota and with Mercedes. Um, we, we open sourced our patents uh, three or four years ago, um, made, them, made them freely available. Um, and uh, so it's, it's ex extremely rewarding to see that the, the rest of the industry is going electric. This is great, great. So. Is it really happening now, though? I mean, I, I wish he were more right about that. You know, we know Elon's an optimist. He's a, he's a self-professed optimist. But who is shipping any electric car in volume? Who's building out a nationwide charging network? 
no one really on is the answer to both of those questions, unfortunately, and that's what's frustrating for the EV movement so far. But it's not to say that Elon's wrong. There's plenty of progress being made. The the Audi e-tron looks like it could be a really good vehicle. Of course, uh, of course, the Porsche <laughs> Taycan looks uh, has got a lot of people excited. So hopefully, and the Bolt's a great car too. And the new the second generation Leaf's really solid. So. It's it's coming along, but um, you know the the quotes that Elon put up about you know it's all happening now and this and that. It's like, well, it's uh, we're, I'm not really seeing it on the roads just yet, but we're getting there. That's the good news. Okay, time for the Model Y itself to be revealed. We had this 30 minute history lesson on where Tesla has been and where they are going. Here is the Model Y. The Model Y. So, uh, like the three, uh, it, it, it will be extremely safe. So that the you may know that the Model Three uh, has the uh, the lowest probability of injury of any car ever tested by the uh, U.S. government. Um, the Model Y, we expect, will have a, a similar result. Uh, five stars in every, ca- every every category. With the battery pack low, low in the floor, it's going to have a very low center of gravity. So this will it 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 has the, the functionality of a of an SUV, but will it will ride like a sports car. So this thing will be really tight in corners, uh, and we expect it will be the, the, the safest uh, a mid-sized SUV in the world by far. And at Tesla, we actually uh, always design with safety as the number one goal. Um, it's it's like like people people think okay performance sure, but but safety first. Um, this is actually by far the most important thing. But it's also going to be have incredible performance. So we expect to have is uh, three and a half seconds zero to sixty. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> um, and uh, very low center of gravity, so great, great uh, handling. Uh, it's, it's testing out at a 0.23 drag coefficient, which is extremely good for an SUV. Um, and in terms of range, 300 miles. Yeah. So we expect to have an EPA range of, uh, an actual true usable range of 300 miles. So, yeah. Yeah. From, an, from an interior standpoint, it has a, a panoramic uh, glass roof. And, and by the way, after, after I'm done here, you guys will be able to come up and like check out the car. So, uh, it's like, um, so it's going to have a panoramic gra- glass roof. It like really feels like just like the Model Three. If you're in the car, it just feels like you're you can see the sky. Uh, seat seat seven. 66 cubic feet, um, obviously autopilot and you know all that. Uh, and uh, uh, as I've said publicly, we expect to be feature complete with uh, with self-driving sometime later this year. Um, and then uh, as as we prove out the safety with uh, billions of miles and kilometers, uh, uh, we will, uh, from our standpoint, feel it's like safe enough to not pay attention and then get the regulatory approval sometime thereafter. Um, but the, the cool thing is feature complete. Like it, it'll be able to do basically anything um, uh, by the end of this year, um, just with soft, just with software upgrades, which is pretty cool. So um, the, the, the the basically long range one we expect to be about forty seven thousand dollars, and then sometime in twenty twenty one we'll have the the sort of standard version, which will be have a thirty nine thousand dollar price point. So yeah. Uh, no, the seven seats are optional. Yeah. Um, do you mean the, the lift gate? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I mean, you never know. We might do better than this, uh, but uh, so it should be at least this good. So, uh, so I think it's going to be very, like really compelling. I'm, I'm confident that it, it'll be the the the. the of, of any mid-sized SUV, it'll be the one you want. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it'll probably sell, I think we'll probably do more Model Ys than S, X, and 3 combined, most likely. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there you have the sexy presentation. So, all right. Uh, so uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, um, 
uh, those of you who are here and those of you who are watching, thank you very much for your support over the years. It's been uh, you know, a hell of a ride. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I love you too. I love you too. Um, we are bringing sexy back quite literally. <laughs> All right, thank you. So as you heard there, Elon thinks that they might sell more Model Ys than the S, 3, and X combined, which effectively works out to the Model 3 annual production and sales plus 100,000, which makes sense. I could totally see that in the United States, certainly. I mean, I know that's, that's a worldwide number he's giving, but the U.S. is, is very much an SUV-crazed country. So uh, we'll see. I, we certainly wish the Model Y very well, and... I'll be curious to start seeing them on the roads in about a year and a half's time or so. So my impressions of it, as I said, I was very lucky to get to go to the event and see it and ride in it. And you, you know, I don't know if you've if you've read or heard anything else online. There were you know a lot of people saying, oh, it was very underwhelming. It was this. It was that. And he, here's my take: it's the Model Y is the Model 3.5. For, and that's not a bad thing. I'm, that is, I do not say that with, with, uh, as a detriment. I mean, the fact of the matter is, or actually it's, it's more of an opinion, I suppose, I think the, the, a Model 3.5 is exactly what this car needed to be. If it ain't broke, and the Model 3 is both successful from a sales perspective and very well liked by customers, then hey, don't fix it. And the Model Y follows that. I mean, the really, fundamentally, the only real difference between those two cars is the third row, which, by the way, was not available on the test rides. Because before my test ride, I thought, oh, I want to try and... You can't really pick where you sit on these test rides and these things, but I thought, oh, let me see if I can try and sneak into the row three, because that would be the most new experience to have. But they were not offering test rides in row three. Anyway, uh, the other big difference from the car, uh, from, from the three to the Y, the panoramic glass roof, which is, it's basically, if you've been in a, in a new Model S, a Model S with the panoramic glass roof, not, not the, the S with the uh, panoramic retractable roof, the, the moon roof, because that's got a cross member beam in the middle, which the Model 3 also has, but I'm talking about the fixed glass Model S uh, that where it's just, it's just all glass over row one and row two, completely uninterrupted. Well, the Model Y has that, and my goodness, it is stunning. It is really, really cool. Um, but I'll talk more about this in a second. But I will say the Model Y from the front, it's and I was just staring at the the white rolling mule that they had sitting inside on display. The the blue prototype from the stage that that actually runs was out doing test rides all night uh, in the dark. So it was, you know, kind of tough to photograph it. It, was, it didn't hold still for very long. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the panoramic glass is great, but the, 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 what I was going to say is the front of the car, it really is, if you're looking at it head on, it's almost indistinguishable from the, from the Model 3. It's a bit taller, which you can see in sort of the proportions of it, but it's really almost dead on a Model 3 from the front. And again, that's not a that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's it's an observation. Uh, as for the test ride itself, so I sat in the second row in the middle seat, which I was I was happy to do. I had no preference really. Uh, the the aforementioned panoramic glass roof, it is awesome, I have to say. I mean it I've I've been in the Model S, just sitting in it. I haven't ridden in a Model S in, in the back seat with that panoramic glass roof, but um, I've sat back there and it's it's just awesome. And and boy, the Model Y, same thing. It is it is spectacular back there from that second row seat. And this was in the middle. This was just at night. I couldn't even. I mean, it would be so great to sit back there during the day. That'd be really cool. But the the panoramic glass roof, by far my favorite feature of the car. Sadly, one that the uh, driver doesn't really benefit from because you know you it you can't really you've got your cross member above your head uh, on the on the, from from row one you know it's really it's really a passenger only experience with that but boy it is it is pretty great the the people who sit in the second row of the Model Y are going to be in for a real treat in that car um, 
So there you go. But uh, the other big key that I, I mentioned earlier, the third row. So Tesla claims it'll seat seven adults. I respectfully don't see how that's possible. The way the roof line slopes, you know, the hatchback, it just, that glass roof really starts to come down. Uh, you've got decent headroom. I was there with my friend Jeff from uh, from the Bay Area here, and he's tall. He's got to be at least 6'2". You know, he, 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 had, he was comfortable in there, but his head was pretty much up against the glass roof. He was sitting next to me in, in the second row. And yeah, third row, I mean, I just, I do not see any way that, that uh, average size adult men or really women for that matter are, are going to be able to fit back there. I really feel like, and again, I'm not saying this as a, as a knock against it. I'm not trying to criticize, but I do just think it's a realistic expectation. You, if you're going to order that, I mean, you're probably ordering it for young children anyway. You probably have a family, you know, young family then yeah, it's going to suit you very well if you've got kids, uh, the, the, to have the kids back there. But uh, yeah, just bear that in mind. And again, they weren't offering uh, rides in the in row three on those test rides. But uh, one other quick comment I want to make, by the way. I believe that the Model Y marks the first time that a public prototype, you know, that first prototype, drivable prototype that's shown to the public of a Tesla vehicle has ever been painted a regular good old production color. In this case, the deep metallic blue that you can you can order right now. You can order the same Model Y. And then the rolling mule inside that was inside on display was pearl white. So, um, you know, I kind of felt like, you know, even that just on a micro level is sort of another kind of less sexy aspect of, of this event. Uh, which I realize I say with a, a bit of tongue-in-cheek irony that that <laughs> Elon kept talking about they're bringing the sexy back. Well, you know this this wasn't the sexiest event from a product reveal perspective, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute too. But um, yeah, they you know I figure my guess is that they went ahead and painted it production a production color, both the real car and the the rolling mule, because they are taking orders. You know, no reservations uh, this time around which I'll talk more about in just a moment. But first, I wanted to give you the audio from my test ride. I've edited edited this down a tad, really more just fast-forwarded it. This is right when we're already in the car and we've started moving and our driver from Tesla starts talking. Take a listen to this. It's not too long. It's about a minute and a half or so. There we go, everybody. Model Y. Um, first thing you'll notice about the interior is it has a lot in common with Model 3. We have the same IP, center display, steering wheel, center console. We also have the same uh, seats, except they're up on a riser, which means you have a better view of the road, um, and it makes ingress and egress a little bit easier. Now, this is a long-range dual-motor vehicle, and it shares the same uh, drivetrain and battery as Model 3, which means you get great performance and acceleration, just like you would in Model 3. Now, uh, along, along with that, the thing this has in common with Model S, Model X, and Model 3 is it has a very low center of gravity, which means through U-turns, turns, weaving through traffic, uh, you get great handling without uh, a lot of body roll. Awesome. I love the uh, Model S style panoramic glass roof back here. No cross member like on my Model 3. Exactly. It's far enough back, it's not behind your head there. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, actually started developing this glass technology with the Model X windshield and the Model 3 backlight, and it gives you a great view, an un unobstructed view of the sky uh, without... Please go ahead. Are you guys crossing? <laughs> they just want to look. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you get a great un unobstructed view of the sky without uh, getting burnt by UV rays during the daytime. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed the ride. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much. Right, thank you. Thank you. And for those of you in the second row, uh, you'll want to exit to the left. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Unfortunately, I did not get the name of the Tesla employee who was driving, so I would I would give him some credit there if I could. I apologize, sir. But the key takeaways for me there 
are that the front seats are the same, but they're on risers to get you up a little bit higher, to get you to a higher seating position and viewing position. And that uh, the prototype was a, because I was going to ask this actually, and he went right to it, as a dual motor long range there. So a 280 mile version. And in fact, that's what the Model 3's prototype, the, at least the Silver Alpha prototype that I rode in, uh, the, you know, there were the two of them. But that was the, the same spec as the Model 3's Alpha prototype. It was uh, secretly a dual motor. We learned later, it turned out. But there you go. So I thought that, that would be fun to bring you, bring you to the event a little bit there with the audio from my very quick test ride. Uh, so let's talk about some other stuff. The rear hatch, uh, it is, I, so I can't 100% confirm this. I heard this second hand, but I believe it does appear that the rear hatch does have a power lift gate. You would expect that. In, in any, uh, you know, premium crossover, even though, even if it's not Model X level premium, you know, that it would, doubt it would be a manual. Yeah, the Model 3 has a manual trunk, but it's a trunk, you know, that's a, it's sort of a little, I guess, more accepted if it's manual. A, a, a lift gate like that on the hatchback, you hope that that's going to be a power lift gate, and it appears that it will be so. Now, the other big question, the tow hitch. That was the other most popular topic going around both the event and then online in the community afterwards. There's no confirmation yet, but there appeared to be, as, as uh, plenty of other people long before me pointed out online, a, a panel uh, that was closed up. You couldn't see behind it, but it was a, a panel on the bottom rear center uh, of the Model Y's, the rear valence down there. Uh, where it even kind of there's there's even kind of a shape for it where it kind of curves down, and it looks like that there is a tow hitch behind that, or at least the ability to have a tow hitch behind that that little panel in the center rear bottom of uh, of the Model Y. So TBD there, but looking good on both the power lift gate and tow hitch fronts. So. Uh, more on what I was saying earlier about the similarities between the three and the Y, and and how just you know my opinion that just being a taller hatchback three with a third row is all that this thing needed to be. I'll tell you this: I actually look at it as a big accomplishment for Elon, and what I mean by that is that he was able to show the restraint necessary to keep this project simple. Get it out the door, you know, 75% parts compatibility. The headlights are the same. The taillights are the same. The front seats are the same. A lot of the interior pieces are the same. The door handles are the same. The wheels are the same. All this stuff, plus who knows all the, I'm sure all the electronics underneath are largely the same as well. But the fact that that Elon uh, actually was able to show the restraint necessary to keep this project simple get it out the door so that it can start making the company a whole ton of money and further the mission. So I, even though it is it is the most conservative Tesla design in the sense of it's, it's definitely the most iterative Tesla design that we've seen yet. You know, we went from Roadster, which was okay, it built on the back of, of a Lotus Elise, even though it doesn't share many parts with it. Uh, the, the family resemblance is certainly there. And then the Model S being a, 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 a white sheet, you know, blank paper design. And the X turned very much turned into its own thing. And then the three, again, pushing the design language forward and, and being its own thing. The Model Y is, is not. Again, it's, it's the Model 3.5. But that's, that's okay. That is what this car needs to be for... Uh, for Tesla to, to, again, for the sake of expediency and simplicity, and, uh, you know, that the, they can avoid, by doing it this way, they can avoid the Model X-style production nightmare that, that happened. Because if you remember way back, if you've been following Tesla for a while, the Model X was originally supposed to be basically an SUVified S, with this on the built on the same platform, and we all know, and Elon, you just heard the clip, they went nuts and they ended up in that production nightmare. And that, that Elon continues, even at this event, to regularly cite as a big mistake. 
despite how great the Model X turned out to be in the end. And here's my little my little sort of conspiracy theory on that is 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 this. I think that Franz and or the Tesla design team uh, basically gave Elon the pickup truck and said, "Here you go, Elon. Go nuts on this. Just go crazy. Do whatever." to keep him away from the Model Y project so that they could keep that simple, get it done, get it locked, and get it, you know, get it built as soon as possible coming up here in the fall of 2020. And I think that's, so they basically just, you know, said, here's a, here's a shiny new thing. Just do whatever you want with it. And we're going to, we're going to be over here just getting, take, you know, doing the Y in a very simple, practical way S- simple design, easy to build. Boom, here you go. Um, but yeah, uh, as I was saying earlier, this not a criticism, but th- this wasn't a sexy unveiling. And I honestly think th- the more I thought about it, I think that's why Tesla structured the event the way they did, as basically a thirty-five, well, a thirty-minute history lesson with a five-minute Model Y reveal at the end. Because I think they knew it. I think that they knew. Hey, this is a very, you know, this is not a radical new design. There is not really a, a fancy new whiz bang feature on this car the way that there have always been on the other Teslas that have been unveiled. Uh, in fact, every single one has had some crazy new thing on it. Um, even the model, you know, the Model Three, the interior, and obviously just the fact that it was a, a more affordable car at the, the thirty-five thousand dollar price objective. But, but there you go. Uh, those are my little pet theories on the Model Y and the event and, and why it was done the way it was done. I was, again, I was surprised that they were not taking reservations. When Tesla didn't say anything leading up to the reveal, I thought, well, you know, they are, they are still, even if they're not going to close so many of the stores after all, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes, they're still moving towards the online-only sales model. So, okay, it makes sense that they wouldn't announce a date ahead of time to do in-store reveals that, you know, just maybe when the event starts or maybe right after the event, they would turn on the reservations. And uh, they did not do any of that. They instead are simply taking orders, actual orders for your car with all your paint color, everything. So my suspicion is that reservations probably turned out to be a much, much bigger headache than they anticipated on the Model 3. You know, they're getting, they're still getting asked by analysts on those investor calls every quarter, how many reservations are still left? And and they never want to talk about it. And now they've done it in a way where they don't, they don't have to talk about it anymore. But yeah, you know, since, since it's basically, it's all the same stuff as Model 3, they know all the options already. They're all the same. So they can just take orders and I suspect that will help them better prepare for production later next year. So that's great. So here's one other thought. I was talking about this with my friend Jeff as we were driving home from, uh, from L.A. back to San Francisco. Should this, meaning the Model Y, should the Model Y have been the car that they built first? Meaning before the Model 3, not before the Roadster or the S. But should they have built the Y before the Model 3, because uh, there is a very good chance that the Model Y could cannibalize Model 3 sales, because a lot of people wanted a hatchback in the Model 3. People loved that on the S, uh, and people wanted it on the 3, didn't get it. You know, we've got a good trunk opening back there, but, you know, this this has a hatchback. It sits up a little higher. Uh, This country loves SUVs. You know, you could make the argument that maybe... Tesla could have and should have started with the Model Y and come with the Model 3 a bit later. You know, that the, they one thing, they certainly would not have been able to achieve that $35,000 price objective had they started with the Model Y. But, uh, you know, it's the, the fact is that maybe, you know, we'll never know, the Model Y could have had an even greater impact than the already impressive impact that the Model 3 has had. It's a, it's a moot point because we'll never know. It's food for thought. But, uh, you know, that, that was an interesting conversation that Jeff and I had on the way back. But nevertheless, this car should do very, very well. Um, again, the 3 is very well liked. So an SUV-ified 3, 
hatchback third row option. It should do really, really well. Elsewhere from the event, I want to tell you a few other things. I want to mention that it was uh, it was so wonderful to see a lot of people from the Tesla community. And I especially want to thank the number of wonderful Tesla employees, uh, Russ being one of them, Brenda being another, who came up to me and said hello and told me that they listened to the podcast. When Because, I, I mean, I'm grateful anybody listens to this, and I'm being completely sincere when I say that. It's, it's no joke. I mean, I, I started this episode one. I had no idea if anyone would ever find this podcast or anyone would ever care about it because you just kind of you, – you, when you make a podcast – you just put it out there, and you can't really advertise it. You just kind of have to hope that it gets picked up maybe in the new and noteworthy section on iTunes, and and maybe it starts to get some reviews and get bubbled up, and maybe people will start to find it. Maybe they're Googling Tesla podcast, something like that. But, you know, when anyway, point being, when I hear – I'm so grateful anybody listens to this, but when I hear that Tesla employees actually listen to this, the very people that – are living this stuff all day every day as it is that they're they're spending their their personal time <laughs> listening to this that they would think enough of it it just means the world to me so uh, it was wonderful to to get to talk to some Tesla employees I got to tell you a quick little story too speaking of Tesla employees Franz von Holzhausen was there and he was kind of just milling about the the event you know he he didn't go behind the curtain he didn't leave or go home he he was hanging out there for a while and a lot of people were taking pictures with him and so i thought you know what i'm i'm here i'm prepared i got to try and get him on the on a recording i got to see if i can just get him for a minute maybe ask him three questions real quick you know you never know and being in media professionally i knew that my odds were so slim, like just extraordinarily slim because, you know, with with a, a high enough person in the company like Franz, you got to go through PR. You got to go through the public relations people, the communications people. You got to set all that stuff up. They got to vet you. They got to do the whole thing. It, yeah. So I, I knew that just walking up to Franz at, at the event here was probably not going to work. But hey, I had my microphone because I was I had myself mic'd up. I didn't really end up getting any useful audio. That's why you're not hearing anything uh, on this episode. But if it, just in case, you know, I'm all I've got myself wired up. I had a second mic, you know, plugged into my recorder that's jammed in my pocket, and I had that in my hand, ready to hand to Franz in case he said yes. But I just walked up to him and said, "Hello, uh, you know, I." I uh, can't wait to to see more of the Roadster, and I've got a Model Three. Is it okay? Can I, might I be able to ask you a few questions real quick for my podcast? He, as he should have, and as I expected, he very politely declined. But I tried, you guys. I did give it a try. Maybe someday I can uh, I can actually sit him down properly, going through the proper channels, because uh, I have a million questions I would love to to ask Franz about about designing the the Tesla family of products. But it was still great. At, the, the nice part is, even though he politely said no to me asking him a few questions, I got to tell him that, hey, I've got a Model 3, and it's been so great. I love it so much. And, and I got to thank him for the car. So that really felt good. There was also, by the way, a V3 supercharging demo happening outside, out in front. Uh, they have added what appears to be two V3 superchargers there at the Hawthorne Design Studio location. Now, they showed uh, back at the hotel the next morning, because I, I I didn't get a chance to charge the car at the hotel before we headed back. I had, had enough miles. I ended up going to the Santa Clarita supercharger, which is pretty much the last one before you got to go over and through the grapevine, the mountains there outside of LA. So um, I thought, well, I, I do need to charge up before we get to the mountains. And I thought, well, boy, it'd be cool to go try out the V3 supercharging, even if I don't have the full software update to, you know, get the full, the full might of it out. Uh, but it was, it was showing in the car as temporarily closed, uh, the, as of Friday morning, but it should hopefully be open now. So if you are based in Los Angeles, if you're in the LA area, you might want to check on your car's nav system. And if it shows as open, you might want to cruise over there and, and check those out. Uh, particularly once you've gotten the on-route battery warm-up software update that will help sort of prime the 
prime the pump even more for even faster supercharging. But there are now, so there's the, the four stall test site for V3 up here in the Bay Area in Fremont near the factory, but not at it. And now the, the uh, again, I'm, this is me guessing. I don't actually know for sure. It appears to be two V3 stalls in addition to all the other V2 stalls at the Hawthorne Design Studio. One other thing about the event. There was a teaser. There was a one more thing, a jobsy and one more thing. And it was a brief, oh so brief teaser, a quick image flashed on the screen of the Tesla pickup truck, or at least part of it. Let me tell you what the, what happened. So uh, the event's over. Everybody, people are are now milling about. They're looking at the the white rolling mule Model Y inside. They're getting uh, a drink. They're going outside to mill about or line up for their test ride. So everybody's kind of scattered about. You know, the room's cleared out a bit. So I'm looking. I'm over there and I'm photographing. I'm looking at the Model Y, uh, the white one inside. And all of a sudden, the lights go down, some music starts up, I turn around, I look at the screen, and there's just, just there shows like a, I don't know if it said test. I think it just, just said Tesla on the screen, and I kind of just, I said, I don't know what this is, but what I just turned back around towards the Model Y, and apparently, basically everyone missed it, including myself, Elon had to post it on Twitter later, they flashed for a second a teaser image of the pickup truck, and it is definitely out there. Elon was not kidding around. Uh, it's so out there. Here's, here's how out there that this thing is. There are genuine, legitimate debates where everyone's making a good case, uh, everyone on both sides, for it being the front of the truck or the back of the truck. So that's how wild and out there this thing is. Because at first, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, well, it's the front. It's the front of the thing. But then I, I started reading some stuff uh, in the community online. People thought, oh, no, that's the bed. That's the back of it. And I said, well, I could see that for sure. But now I'm kind of back. I'm, my thinking is now back towards it's the front. So I'm not really sure. And I'm now very eager to see this thing. It is, uh, it is pretty crazy. If you want to see it, check out Elon's Twitter account. It is, uh, you can click on the, you know, the photos and videos thing to, to kind of go right to it. But it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be, it is going to be as, as advertised, very Blade Runner-esque, very futuristic, very much out there compared to anything else in any product lineup, let alone the, even the Tesla lineup. So there you go. This, so that's the Model Y event. If you have questions about it, call in, email in, whatever you want to do, let me know. I'll give you the Actually, I guess I might as well give you the call-in information now. So uh, the show's long enough and, and complicated enough and also late enough. It's Saturday night. So again, I, I warned you last week, but I want to apologize to the Patreon supporters who enjoy the early access to the show. Normally, I get the show done on late Friday night. You know, So you've got, really, you wake up Saturday and it's there for you if you're on Patreon with me. That didn't happen this week. I was driving back all day Friday Got to get back and get some family time Friday and get my, had to spend a bunch of time getting my notes together. Anyway, I'm not going to make excuses. I mean, but know that I <laughs> work very, I put a lot of time and energy into this. Uh, but here we are late Saturday. So I'm going to skip the Ride the Lightning hotline this week. If you've called in over the past week, I've got your call. I've listened to most of them. Uh, so we'll, we'll get back to the Ride the Lightning hotline next week. And in fact, that's what I wanted to offer up here is if you've got either questions for me about sort of my impressions of it or things you're not sure of, or if you just want to give your take on the Model Y or the event itself from watching at home, um, I, then please call in. I would love to hear from you. Please, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's make next week's show a, a Model Y reaction show. If, you know, if, I'm very curious if you're buying it. I'm, I'd be sort of curious to hear if you were dead set on buying it already and you watched the event and you just locked it in or if you weren't going to buy and then the event swayed you or maybe the other way around maybe you were going to buy it and the event you kind of got turned off to it a little bit for whatever reason so whatever way you're going i'd be curious to hear from you again please try to keep your calls to 90 seconds or less one minute and a half or less please but you can call in uh, anytime day or night 
either on the toll-free Ride the Lightning hotline, which is, uh, can be dialed at 1-888-989-8752, or you can simply use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software and record something at a minute and a half or less and email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail. Dot com. So I look forward to doing, uh, getting caught up on all the hotline calls next week, including all of your Model Y reactions, questions, etc. So the other thing this week, which I teased at the top of the show, again, this is a heck of a gear shift. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a not so elegant segue, but I just, I don't even know how to <laughs> easily, smoothly transition to this, but. Got to do it. Got to address this this week. So you probably heard about this prior to the Model Y event. Tesla walked back the store closures and the layoffs. Well, mostly anyway. From Tesla's blog, quote, Over the past two weeks, we have been closely evaluating every single Tesla retail location, and we have decided to keep significantly more stores open than previously announced as we continue to evaluate them over the course of several months. When we recently closed 10% of sales locations, we selected stores that didn't invite the natural foot traffic our stores have always been designed for. These are stores that we would have closed anyway, even if in-store sales made up our entire sales model. A few stores in high-visibility locations that were closed due to low throughput will be reopened, but with a smaller Tesla crew. In addition, there are another 20% of locations that are under review, and depending on their effectiveness over the next few months, some will be closed and some will remain open. As a result of keeping significantly more stores open, Tesla will need to raise vehicle prices by about 3% on average worldwide. In other words, we will only close about half as many stores, but the cost savings are therefore only about half, end quote. Well, the bottom line, bottom line, I'm really happy that Tesla is doing this. Let me be super clear about that up front. They realized what, what certainly I believed, I talked about it last week, I, and I'm far from alone. I, I and many others in the community believed uh, that to be a mistake on Tesla's part. I, I think that there is so much value in those stores, and certainly in the Tesla employees in those stores. I said that I felt it was a long-term mistake to achieve a short-term goal of getting the $35,000 Model 3 out sooner. And I still believe that. So I'm very glad that they're walking this back. I'm really, really happy about it. Uh, I'm sad that some people still will lose their jobs at Tesla. That's never good. And Tesla's seen a lot of that over the past year. There's there's no denying that. So, so there it is. And, you know, while I don't want to dwell too negatively on, on what is ultimately now the best decision, in my opinion... At the same time, it's fair to acknowledge that this is another instance in what is sadly becoming a bit of a pattern of behavior at Tesla, where it seems like they just don't think through all of the possible outcomes and consequences when they make these very big, seemingly very quick decisions and policy changes. Because as the company grows, these kinds of mistakes are going to be even more costly. This, this past week, justifiably sh- so, pardon me, has shaken the confidence of the following people. Tesla customers, Tesla shareholders, and most certainly Tesla employees, many of whom either lost their job, feared for it, or as you heard in that Tesla blog, might still fear, feel, f- f- pardon me, fear for it, because they're, if they're being evaluated over the next three months and they might still get closed. You know, that's just not healthy for anyone. You know, it, it's not good for morale at the company, certainly. And, and you know, people do their best work when they have, their morale is high. I think that Elon needs a new George Blankenship. George, if you don't know, was a guy way back in the early Tesla days. I'm talking the Roadster days. He was effectively a customer advocate. He was sort of part PR person, part community manager, maybe even part ombudsman to an extent, even. That 
That is what I feel that Tesla needs right now. Somebody like that to have a seat at the table when these kinds of big decisions and big policy changes are being debated. Somebody who can sit there and say, hang on, let's talk about what this is going to mean for our existing customers, our potential new customers, and our awesome Tesla community that we want to keep the loyalty and enthusiasm of. You know, because the, the, you, you all know Tesla's got plenty of people gunning for them. There's no need to help those people out by Tesla shooting itself in the foot on these things. So here's hoping that they consider adding somebody like that to the executive team. Uh, I, the, I have a person in mind, and she, some of you may know, you may know her or know of her in the community. But, um, you know, I don't know who that person is. I'm talking like a senior level kind of situation that would, you know, basically be on the executive team with Elon. I, th I think that would that would be a good step towards helping to prevent these things from happening in the future. And in fact, I tweeted a condensed version of all of that at Elon uh, earlier this week. And to my surprise, he actually replied and he said, sure, that'd be great. Uh, because I have to tell you, I, I really, uh, most of the time when I'm tweeting at Elon, I, I am asking a question, hoping for a response. This time, I wasn't even looking for a reply. I was just hoping he would see it and it would enter his brain, assuming he hasn't thought about it already. Is I'm sure he probably has, but hey, you know, you never, never assume. So thought I would put the thought out there and hope to get his attention with it. And thankfully, at least I know I did since he replied. So that's good, and it's and it's great to hear that he's open to it. I mean, he chose to reply. He could have he could have just said, "Oh, you know, that's we're we're fine with the team we have," or he could have said a million different things. But he left. You know, he he acknowledged that he's open to the possibility. So, again, I, I think it would be a really important and at this point almost a necessary role for the company, just as it continues to grow. You want to avoid these things as the company gets bigger. So there's that. Now on a related note, I'm almost done. I promise. It's been a, it's been an action packed episode already, but as you may have heard, Elon has said that the autopilot prices are going back up. So no more $2,000 full self-driving upgrade for people that have enhanced autopilot. So, uh, you you've got the three th the full self-driving. I, it's happening on Monday, so I'm not sure if it's going to be $4,000 for full self-driving for those of us with enhanced autopilot, because that's what was that was what was quoted to us when we ordered the $4,000 after delivery price. So we'll find out very soon. In fact, by the time a lot of you even hear this podcast, the answer to that may have already been discovered. But either way, I, I think I ended up buying full self-driving at a good time. And by the way, if you're hearing this on Sunday, if you're a Sunday listener and you've got a Tesla and you've got enhanced autopilot and you're debating full self-driving, maybe if you, if you think you're going to have your car for a bit longer and if Tesla really does deliver urban full self-driving features, city, city features later this year, or maybe even, you know, first half of next and you think, well, you know, that might be worth it. The prices are going back up on Monday. So Sunday, if you're hearing this on Sunday, it is your last chance to get it at the, uh, what I guess we can now call sale price. So uh, consider that. But uh, there you go. Now, we do know, one thing we do know for sure, the early adopters who did pay for both enhanced autopilot and full, full self-driving when they ordered they are still going to get invited to the early access program. That comes per a follow-up tweet from Elon. They're not, they're not taking that away. They're not revoking that or rolling that back. So you'll still get the invitation to that. So that's good at least. And <laughs> one way or the other, for better or for worse, this whole thing is over as of this week. <laughs> um, so that's, that is that. All right, uh, I'm going to come right back and tell you a little bit about my road trip with, again, with my friend Jeff uh, and down, you know, took, I took my car, the Spirit of Adventure, down from San Francisco to Los Angeles to attend the Model Y event and, and made and uh, came on back, of course, and uh, down one day and back the next. It was a quick turnaround. I'll tell you a little bit about that adventure, and then I'll wrap things up for you right after this.
So as I mentioned, I drove the Spirit of Adventure down to the Model Y event, because I'm fortunate enough to have free supercharging, and I thought, well, it would be just a fun adventure on top of being free, save myself a flight cost. It did take a while, you know, it, it takes some time, you gotta make your charging stops, it's, a, it's a, the better part of a day, but I had a, a co-pilot, my friend Jeff, it was just a really great trip, I have to say, uh, the, I, the conditions were almost ideal. It was, you know, Thursday, late morning and afternoon that we drove down, not a ton of traffic. The weather was super mild, but it's like sunny and nice. So it's like, it wasn't too cold for the car. It wasn't too hot. It was between basically like 60 and 70 the, the whole way through. It was really, uh, an enjoyable time. Just talking Tesla the whole way down with Jeff. Uh, he's got Two Model S's, actually. Him and his wife both have an S. Jeff is one of the earliest. He's got a really early Model S. He's got a, what, I think, De December 2012. So the very first year, uh, he'd, been on the, he'd been on the waiting list for his Model S for a few years before they finally started production on them. But, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a really excellent time. So the trip down was easy. We stopped at uh, Harris Ranch, which I hadn't been to. I, I missed that one on my San Francisco to Arizona trip and back. So it's neat to see Harris Ranch. I get uh, they get if you like steak, boy, they've uh, that is the the place to stop at and just <laughs> get a nice full charge and enjoy a big old steak. We we didn't there, uh, but uh, yeah, we went in, to use the restroom and and finished up charging. Plenty of chargers there, and then stopped at uh, Tejon Ranch just before the grapevine, just before those mountains heading into L.A. And that one, uh, it's got a few fast food places around there. And some of the chargers are under an overhang, but not all of them. So I guess, I think maybe they've expanded that site at some point. But yeah, and then from there, we're able to get uh, right on over the mountains and down into L.A. and, and down to the hotel. Uh, and uh, we stayed right near uh, near LAX because LA, LAX is uh, itself near Hawthorne. So just grabbed a reasonable rate at a at a nearby hotel there by the airport and yeah it was just it was great to see everybody and get to the event and we made it on time everything was cool and then on the way back again same thing just ideal conditions great great weather uh we got out of la i we got back so late from the event it was it was about 1 a.m. when we got home from uh, from the event, so it was, I got to bed very very late. So I slept in, got some got some rest, and figured, well, let's let's wait till morning rush hours over and then try and get out of here. So it was a little after 10 a.m. when we finally embarked on our return journey, and that we were able to zip right out of L.A. No traffic really, so that proved to be a a wise move. And, and as I think I mentioned earlier on the show, we stopped at Santa Clarita. Uh, which was which I had stopped at on the way on one on one of the San Francisco, Arizona legs during that round trip. Uh, that's that's a pretty nice one. It's a big outdoor mall, so there's like a big uh, nice grocery store. You could get some supplies there. There were a few. I think there were a few places to eat as well. So that was a good one. And then and then we purposely made for Kettleman City. After that, so we just we charged enough to make sure we could get to Kettleman City because Jeff hadn't seen Kettleman, uh, and again I, I'd only been there once. I, I'd I'd made a point to go on my last road trip, so we made a point to go again here for Jeff and got there. And boy, I just had to tell you that place, I love it. It is that is the the supercharging ideal, really. It is just a phenomenal spot. You know, again, forty V two superchargers. Uh, boy, Matt, I wonder if they'll ever upgrade that place to, to V3s. Then, then you wouldn't even need a lounge, I guess, because you'd barely need to stay there very long. But you know, they've got the lounge with the the barista. You get the you get coffee, you get cappuccino. They've got a merch stand. They had some T-shirts. And when I went when I went over the holidays, I'd heard about that there was just a there was a Kettleman City Supercharger T-shirt, like basically a you know, like an I was here kind of thing. They didn't have them over the holidays, but they did on this one. So I bought one and it was actually, it was more reasonably priced than I expected. It was, uh, what is that? I think it was $21 I paid. So uh, that's like, well, that's usually for those, you know, I've bought plenty of Tesla t-shirts before. Usually they're 30 bucks. So, uh, I was, I was pleasantly surprised when the bill was, <laughs> was less than that, but I got my souvenir t-shirt. They've got the, the game of, um, 
what's the game where you throw the bean you're trying to throw the bean bags in the in the tilted you know wood thing that has the hole in it the uh boy i'm blanking on the name of that you know what i'm talking about though so they got that outside they've got uh dog relief areas outside they've got uh, uh, windshield washer stations outside, which thank goodness. Cause they're, I hit, uh, literally and figuratively so, so many bugs, uh, between <laughs> both ways, both, uh, going down there and coming back on I five, just a lot of bugs and all kinds of bug guts on the front of the car. Thankfully I'd come prepared with uh, a solution that I'd put into these bottles mixed up from instructions from Immaculate Reflections uh, with, a, with a particular, you know, soft towel that wouldn't scratch anything uh, to spritz down and wipe it down and get those bug guts off. But I ran out of it. I only, like, I didn't, I didn't have a full bottle with me. So that, that last stop, I had to just let the bugs be. But at least I could easily clean my windshield thanks to the windshield washer stations there. They do also have a tire, uh, they have an air air pressure thing for tires at Kettleman as well. But yeah, the lounge is super nice. There's, uh, again, there's like a little kind of a, not like a dedicated play area for kids, but there's room if you've got kids and uh, it's just a, a great stand. And when I walked in and I, uh, we were gonna, we picked up lunch at In-N-Out across the, the street and then brought it over and we we're gonna eat it while the car was charging. And so, uh, you know, pull, went inside and I went, I went to, before I sat down to eat, I went up to, I saw the shirt I wanted. So I go up and ask, so I, can I, do you have that shirt? Can I please get one of those? And there was a, a, a mobile service technician from Tesla standing there. He says, hi, my name's Daniel. And he just introduced himself. And I said, oh, hi, nice to meet you. And I said, because uh, I'd heard and in fact seen that, that over the holidays, the holiday travel season, you know, Thanksgiving to Christmas, they had been, Tesla had been keeping a mobile service tech at Kettleman City to help people out on road trips, you know, proactively with anything that they might have come up as they, as they stop there. And uh, so I, that's, I mentioned that. I was like, oh, I thought I, I saw that that was a thing over the holidays. I didn't realize you'd still be here. And so, yeah, it's, I, it may be permanent. I'm not sure. But yeah, Daniel was super nice. And uh, it was pretty quiet at Kettleman City at that point. It was the middle of the afternoon. So as I was eating, I was saying to Jeff, boy, is there anything, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I could ask Daniel to look at while, while I'm here. He's not, he's not with anyone else. He's not with another customer. And uh, so, so I thought that when I was washing the car before I left, my, my uh, inside, the, the innermost part of the, the left taillight was kind of a little loose. Like there was, you could reach up under it and there was kind of a little bit of give to it. Whereas the right side, which is the side that had been replaced from that crack in the housing, there was that just defect that they swapped out for me when I first got the car. That one had been replaced. That one was rock solid. So I said, oh, hey, Daniel, can you take a look at this? Would you mind taking a look at this taillight for me? And he takes a look and it's like, oh, yeah, this, uh, this every, every, he basically it turned out to be the part. But uh, and he didn't have a taillight in the van. Otherwise, he would have swapped it out right then and there. Uh, but he, you know, he, he took my trunk panel off and adjusted what he could and it made a little bit of a difference, but he can even acknowledged, Hey, yeah, this, this needs to be replaced at, you know, at some, not no rush, but at some point. So he made a note in my, my, uh, service record so that whenever I do contact Tesla about it, they'll have it there that, that it was looked at by a Tesla tech. And I just, I just want to say like, it's first of all, Daniel himself Daniel said he works out of the Bakersfield uh, location. So Daniel from the Bakersfield uh, service team, you are awesome. Thank you very much. And just how, I, I want to say how wonderful that is that Tesla is doing that. That they're, you know, this is their their largest supercharger station on the West Coast. It is the sort of a, a main artery for Northern and Southern California. And uh, I love how that they're just proactively positioning a tech there to help people out. Like that's only going to make people happy. Like my car was charging while Daniel was looking at the taillight. So it was two birds, one stone. I'm, I'm charging up and he's looking at this taillight thing for me. Just awesome. So yeah, if you're ever traveling between Northern and Southern California, either direction, Make a point to stop at Kettleman City because it's it's really a neat supercharger site to see. And apparently, by the way, 
Daniel told me that uh, the Tesla Semi, I guess, had left the event and come back up north and stopped at Kettleman City to charge uh, like a few hours earlier. We missed we missed the, the Semi by a few hours. So that was kind of cool to hear. Uh, I guess this, this station's so large that there's plenty of room for the Semi to pull in, and I'm sure it has to block a few spots in order to charge up, but... Uh, good stuff. Loved loved my time in Kettleman. Like uh, we stayed there for an hour between we were eating, we were charging. I bought my shirt, and then with Daniel uh, and uh, and the fact that I was wiping down my windshield. So all that was going on, and we were there for a good hour, which is a long time. But it was a fun hour. It was like a fun, even it was productive. It was a fun and productive hour. All right, before I go, a quick pro tip of the week. I've had this one on hold for a while. Antonio from Lake Elsinore, a regular caller. Antonio probably thought, oh, I guess Ryan's never playing that pro tip I sent in months ago. Oh, no, Antonio. I've been sitting on a pile of these, and yours is up next. Here it is. Hi, Ryan. This is Antonio from Lake Elsinore. A quick tip on the Model 3 UI. On the bottom uh, icon, the third icon from the left side is the little icon that brings up the web energy calendar camera charging and the call button. Well, if you just put your finger over that icon and slide it, you can slide it sideways, either side or up or down, it doesn't matter, just put your finger and slide it. You bring up the last screen that we had there. So if you had, for example, the last thing you had seen was the camera, when you put your finger on it and you slide it, you're going to see the camera coming back up. Now, um, it only works for the, for the bottom icons, which are uh, the camera, the charging and the call. It does not work for calendar, energy, and web. Although, if you if your last app was, say, the web, you can still slide it up to see the web, but you can't you can't um, collapse it or slide it sideways. So it's almost like a glitch. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for that little mini shortcut. If you have a pro tip that you've learned about your Tesla, something that's come up that you think, well, maybe that's that's not super obvious. Maybe other people would want to know about this as well, feel free to send it in. Again, just record it either with the hotline, call in, leave the message, or record it on your smartphone and send that to the uh, email address that I gave out earlier in the show. Time for plugs. I want to mention Abstract Ocean. Real quick apology. The link that I gave out last week, uh, not a discount, turns out, on that through that link. The, the, the discount is only the RTL podcast coupon code for first-time customers. So I apologize for the confusion. That was actually this completely my fault, the miscommunication on that. But nevertheless, if you haven't shopped at abstractocean.com before, they are loaded for bear with all kinds of excellent Tesla accessories for both you and your car, uh, whether you're looking for a tempered glass screen protector, a center console wrap, the TESLA lettering, uh, the, the puddle lights are very popular to, to replace the light on the bottom of your door when you open it to have it shine down like the bat signal into a Tesla T logo or Model S logo, X or 3 logo. You can get all of that stuff. Anyway, uh, pile everything in your cart that you're interested in and then uh, get it all in there at once because then the RTL podcast coupon code, all one word, RTL podcast, uh, that gets you 15% off of your first order at abstractocean.com. Meanwhile, Immaculate Reflections, taking good care of my car with the, uh, if you're interested in either new car delivery prep, a good old fashioned, just deep clean, like clay bar, the whole nine yards, like uh, deep cleaning, you can they can take care of that for you. If you want to do paint correction, paint protection film, ceramic coating, any of that, all of that, They'll do it all for you. Just uh, talk to Jeff, figure out what's going to work for you with what you want that fits your budget. Uh, you can learn more at their website, irdetailing.com. You can also look them up on Yelp and Instagram at uh, immaculate underscore reflections on those websites as well. The Patreon, that is the number one way that you can support this podcast if you so choose. As I always make sure to make clear, it's completely optional. Nothing is ever held back. There are just extra things that are available to you that I try to, you know, throw you a few extra little fun bits if you do uh, see fit to support me. 
So there's one tier where you can get early access to the show. You know, I typically record it on Friday night, so you can record, you can listen to it as soon as it's recorded rather than waiting till Sunday morning. There's the uh, monthly Patreon exclusive bonus episode on one of the tiers. And of course, if you go with one of the higher tiers, you get everything at the lower tiers as well. Anyway, uh, learn more at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. If you want to, again, only if you want to, I'd love you to, but it's, uh, it's all totally optional. The show will always be there for you every Sunday morning, uh, at 9 a.m. Eastern time, Twitter, DMC underscore Ryan, Instagram, same thing. Uh, the Jada wireless charging pad, they've got version two out now complete with the P3D proof, uh, sort of lip at the bottom to keep the phone from flying out when you launch it. So if you're interested in picking up the wireless charging pad for model three, if you've got a Qi capable wireless charging phone, smartphone, that, uh, that, that product may be of use to you. It fits in really nicely. Installation couldn't be simpler. Again, they were nice enough. I had bought version one, and then they kindly, they sent me uh, a courtesy version two. And yeah, version two is way better. In every, I mean, not, not well, way better. It's just, it's what it originally should have been. Not that V1 was bad, but V2 is really good. So I don't have a discount code for you, but I do have a, an affiliate link. You know, the, if, they, if you decide to buy one, I'd appreciate it if you would use this link because they throw me a couple bucks from the sale. So that link is getjada.com slash R-E-F slash eight. And Jada, again, is spelled J-E-D-A. I want to thank the Patreon producers. I talked to Patreon a few minutes ago. Uh, These are the folks that, uh, among many little benefits, they get their name mentioned each and every week. The newest Patreon producer... A big hello to Austin Allen. Austin, thank you so much for your support. Alongside the ongoing support of Paul Hussey, DJ Harbaugh, Pete White, Wolfgang Obergen, George Cassiopo, David Brander, Jonathan Wales, Alexi Heft, Logan Willis, Matthew Para, Michael Lester, Robert Maracle, Jason Chalukas, Emotion Rentals, Tim Hyde, Marcus Mayenshine, Lars Hoffman, Peter Chalet, Rome Strack, David Vakil, Ulrich Lassa, Luke A., Eric Randolph, David Nondahl, Gabriel Salais, Jerry and Mary Smith, Brian Hope, Bill Royko, Lyle Austin, Joel Sapp, Dory and Steve Guberman, Luxendary.com, Michael Waddle, Daniel Grummer, Blake Wiley, Tyler Van Gorder, Josh, Jeremy, Jeremy Harris, Tesla Owners Taiwan, Rob Brewer, and My Tesla Adventure. Thank you all so, so much for your continued support of this podcast on Patreon, which, by the way, you can subscribe to this podcast. That's free. That doesn't cost you a dime. It's uh, just so that the podcast gets downloaded to you every time there's a new episode rather than you having to go seek it out. Subscribe for free on any of the major podcast services, whichever one you prefer. Uh, That includes iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, uh, YouTube, or the Tesla, pardon me, the podcast hosting site, which is at teslapodcast.libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com. That will wrap it up for an extended Model Y uh, reveal episode. I knew this would be a long episode. Uh, had, had it mentally prepared for that. Hopefully you did too. And hopefully you found this long episode valuable to you. I appreciate your time each and every week. I, I like to say that because I think it's important to not take for granted. So thank you all so, so much. I won't take any more of your time. Have a great week. Happy electric motoring. And I'll see you back here next Sunday. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. <laughs> That's what it's meant to be. Well, our goal is to make it's it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. Mm. Make it's maximum fun.